Go for it. Okay. We're going to call the meeting to order and we'll start with the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'd like to thank everybody for coming out tonight. We'll start with the approval of the agenda. I have a couple changes. We're going to delete L1, the attorney's report. Thank you for coming. If she already left, she left. Good night. We're going to add 16th Street discussion to the engineer's report. And under the mayor's report, Dwayne has a recognition he'd like to do so. We'll add Dwayne under the mayor's report for number three. Anything else, Tim? No, oh, I don't have anything else. Dan? Yeah. Oh, good. Dwayne? No. Good. Good. All right. Entertain a motion to approve as changed. So make that motion. Thank uh, you. Second. Thank you. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimously, Linda. Next on to the consent agenda. Any questions for the administrator or any comments you have, Tim, on that? I don't have any additions to the consent agenda. Okay. Hearing none, I'll entertain a motion for approval. I'll make that motion. Thanks, Dwayne. Do I have a second? I'll second. Thanks, Lonnie. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. On to be visitors to the council. Fire department. All right, uh, Mr. Administrator, Council, um, Mr. Mayor, I uh, appreciate uh, the opportunity to recognize uh, a few of our young citizens in our, our community and also uh, uh, pool employees, city employees, um, for their acts on June 30th. Um, on June 30th, 2020, at 9.09, <coughs> the uh, Cassin Emergency Medical Responders were called to the Cassin Aquatic Center uh, for a child, Maggie Boyce, um, and CPR was in progress. Um, when our responders uh, arrived on the scene, um, Maggie at the time um, was sitting with a member of the lifeguard staff, um, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, Marley? Yeah. So, um, and uh, um, Maggie at that time um, was treated um, by some of our members um, and transferred care to Dodge Center Ambulance uh, for transport to St. Mary's um, where uh, she had uh, spent the evening um, just for observation um, and then was released uh, the very next day. Um, it is my understanding that uh, uh, as of today Maggie is doing absolutely wonderful um, and, uh, and, and enjoying the rest of her summer. So. Um, after the call, uh, a few of uh, my members and myself um, reviewed with some of the, uh, some of the lifeguard staff uh, and supervisor, uh, Josh Mitchell, um, in regards to kind of some of the events that uh, took place that day. Um, and Josh, if you can um, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, uh, Maggie wasn't in the water very long, um, and it was 13 seconds. From recognition to getting them out of the water. Yeah, from the time the girls saw her to getting her out of the water doing CPR um, was absolutely unbelievable. So, um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, at uh, at this time, um, I'd like uh, the staff that's in attendance here tonight. Um, we had one that was uh, not able to make it, um, Elena Gossard, um, but uh, Mariah Maston. Marley Smith and Supervisor Josh Mitchell. If you guys can all come up here, please. Um, on behalf of the Casson Fire Department and the City of Casson, we recognize all three of you uh, with the Life Saving Award for outstanding performance and heroic life saving actions on June 30th, 2020, in, in Casson, Minnesota. Your actions reflect the highest standards of conduct for the city of Casson and bring great honor to our community. On behalf of the Casson Fire Department and our community, we recognize and thank you for your actions during that life-saving event. Congratulations to all of you. Uh, Mariah?
buddy. And that was our presentation along with the certificate of recognition. They all uh, received a, a pin um, that we give to all of our members for their life saves um, that uh, basically just says that uh, they, uh, they made CPR count. So uh, congratulations again and thank you very much. Thank you. One second before you all go. Um, so we have our EMS folks, obviously. You guys are extremely proud, right? You do this every day. And then we have teenagers that we train and we expect are ready. And by golly, you were. So can't tell you how much the community is proud of you. Um, when we hear of an incident at the pool, I got a phone call within about 10 minutes asking me, did you hear what happened at the pool? And I didn't. So my, my heart sunk as soon as I heard, did you hear what happened at the pool? And then I didn't have any more information. Uh, but to hear the outcome and that you guys took the training seriously and were right there and did that, I can't tell you that uh, the community is so proud of you for what you did. Because remember, every person that's in that pool is somebody's child, neighbor, friend, relative. Um, and we appreciate that, everything you guys do at the pool. Because people don't realize how dangerous a public swimming pool is. And you guys make it safe for the people that enjoy that. So thank you from the bottom of our hearts for area of the community. You're your heroes. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Have a great night. Okay, on the scene, Kathy O'Malley appointment to the EDA. I'd like to recommend the appointment of Kathy to the EDA board. It was approved by the EDA and sent here for approval. So I'd like to make that recommendation. I'll make the motion to approve. I'll second that. Yeah, any further discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. I suppose. Uh, Dwayne, why don't you do your recognition now for that part? Then. All right. Uh, I just wanted to take a, a minute or two here just to public recognize uh, Joe Gazinski. Uh, Joe Gazinski, um, many of you may know, passed away on Tuesday, uh, July uh, 28th. Joe was a long-term uh, city attorney for us. I had the pleasure and honor of working with Joe for more than a decade. Um, when I was on my previous uh, appointment here on the city council, Joe worked with the city for 33 and a quarter years as our city attorney. So I thought it was important that we just take a minute or two just to recognize uh, the fact and the contributions that he brought to the city and um, our sincere condolences go out to his family. Thanks, Frank. Appreciate that. Okay, next one is uh, mental health care discussion. Um, <coughs> asked him three, four weeks ago about an idea or thoughts, and I know other people talked about it too, but uh, with with the whole COVID-19 situation that's going on, um, the toll on mental health in the community and, and, and worldwide, everywhere, it's not just Casson, but in Casson, uh, we have an opportunity with some of these CARES Act funds to spend some of those, spend that money on expenses related to COVID-19 issues or expenses. So these are just my notes, it's nothing official here. Uh, but. So I kind of was kind of spitballing and had some different ideas um, as to a couple goals. Of what I'm asking the council is to take some of those funds and allocate about $25,000 or more of the care, care funds to a mental health initiative in the city of Casson. From students to seniors, there are many in need providing citywide training and access to consultation if desired. I'm able to make a positive impact on an individual, family, or perhaps even save a life. So two goals that I had when I first thought about it was how can we provide educational training to everybody in the community that would like to take it and we can encourage people to take it so that we can help out our counselors, our teachers, because we put a lot of, especially with our students, you know, we put a lot on our teachers' plates and a lot on our school counselors' plates who spend six hours a day with 2,200 kids. We need to be able to react to this stuff or if we identify it as a neighbor, as a coach, as a friend, to be able to say, hey, you know, question, you know, 
convince the person that, hey, it's okay to ask for help and kind of break the stigma that it's, it's not a weakness to ask for help. And then how do we help our, especially our young people, deal with failure and shame, um, especially in the internet uh, social media age that we're living in? You know, when we were kids, I can tell you, when I was in junior high and high school, I'm thankful there was no Facebook. Um, yeah. The dumb things that we did, they aren't there forever for everybody in the world to see in a matter of two seconds. We could pay the consequences, pay your price for it, and then move on and you were able to forget about it. It wasn't brought up to you. Where now, you know, if somebody says or does something, you know, it's not very bright, it just it isn't forgetting. And these kids are having a really tough time with that. The, the, this is forever, and well, it kind of is. You know, it's going to be there, but there, there's a way to get through tomorrow. Um, so just a way to provide education to the community. And then the other one I had was I've talked to a few different public health nurses and counselors over the years, and I asked, you know, what, what, what are some of the barriers that we could use some of this money for? And one of the ones that we come up with was some folks aren't making the phone call because they can't afford it. Uh, they either don't have insurance and they can't afford it at all, or they can't afford copay right now, especially with COVID-19. So I think it's a very valid use of the funds for COVID-19 directly related to stuff. So then I went on the path of searching for partners to fill up a, a toolbox that we could have, you know, everybody in town could have a toolbox. Quick reference toolbox, whether it's electronic. The one company even said we could print up some little cards when we do it, but if you run into somebody, here's some questions to ask. Here's who to call if it's an emergency, obviously it's 911, but you know, here's the different resources you could call. And if we can equip, you know, an entire community with that, I mean, we may have a chance to make a difference here. So I've talked, I'll just run through the places I've talked to and some of the things they've come up with. Lumber Valley Health, Josh Jensen, he runs the Regional Mobile Crisis Program. Uh, Dodge County is a member of that. Um, he's willing to provide his QPR, which is question, persuade, and refer. Um, suicide Prevention Program, he has a one-hour program. Um, usually lasts a little bit longer than that. Uh, he can do groups of 25 up to 50 if he has another mental health professional with him. He could do live or webinar if we had a place to do live that was uh, able to socially distance. Uh, he recommended, uh, and in the conversation with some other folks we had um, early in the week, a documentary by Kevin Hyams, The Suicide of the Ripple Effect. Um, he, he recommended, it's a, it's a great video, it's about an hour and a half. He said, but he wouldn't necessarily, with COVID right now, it's tough. He said, usually he does it in a big thing with a big group of people, and then he does questions and answers afterwards that it's just not practical, but we can get access to that. It's pretty simple. It's available on Google Play, is that a thing? Whatever that is. So there's some licensing issues. I'll come back to that in a second. Um, so those are some of the things Denver Valley Health, he just immediately said they could do. Fernbrook, working with Kelsey. Um, they can do, they'll put together up to five different presentations, which would be the next steps of figuring what five presentations would we want. They would put those on. They could do them live, but they really aren't doing that right now, but it's more likely to be a webinar. And then part about the free consultations, they're willing to do up to 75 one-hour consultations for individuals and families at about $150 each. That If we would do that, we could pay for that as they happen. And on that, it's kind of a, my idea there was we, we only have about 60 to 75 days to do this because the funds we have for COVID are three months, say. Well, that gets my ideas on that too. So, but we have a deadline to <coughs> allocate these COVID funds. But, but I'm thinking, well, as we talked through that with Fernbrook um, on the consultations, and see, we want to see if people will take advantage of it. So it's kind of a test run. Okay, if we have 75, there we go. We get the word out, hey, this is available. If you need help, call them, set up a time. You can go in and meet with them for an hour, family or individual, whatever it is. And in 60 days, if we don't have anybody call that number, well, we know we don't need to allocate our time trying to, you know, they say like firmer to move on to something else, use your funds somewhere else. So, but all of a sudden, if we find out, we put that out there in there, we use the 75 spots, or we have 200 people called and we have 75 spots. Now, as private organizations are fundraising in the community, because we've got several benefits throughout the year that raise money for mental health issues. If we knew that was a need that our community was willing to use, now we have tangible outcome to raise funds for and you'll raise funds for it you know cities schools whoever can allocate small parts of their budget to help with that you know for community health so that was the idea behind that cam schools i'm working with a couple of the school counselors that got back to me they're in their summer mode right now 
uh, but there were some good ideas on how we could integrate it into the school. Uh, Mayo Clinic, I've had a couple of different Zoom conference calls with them, and I got up to the co-chair of Integrated Behavioral Health, and like he told me yesterday, some great ideas, they may be able to help with some education, but Mayo doesn't really move that quickly um, on new initiatives or things, so um, that's what he said. He said, I'm just going to be honest with you, we don't really move quick on anything, so they're willing to help do what they can, but their method of delivery for this type of service doesn't kind of fit the model of walking in and doing it as it goes to the primary care provider. So they're, they're on board to help them do something, but they just aren't sure what it is yet. We're going to have to do a bit more. Uh, NAMI, I talked with Sean Tancillo this morning. He offers those QPR classes as well. He's got a three hour class, groups of 20. It's online, it's eight dollars a person. So something we could, if we decided to do this, we could put together, hey, we can schedule a couple of these meetings, see how many people want to do it. We can schedule as many as we can do. Uh, they also have a mental first aid uh, mental health first aid program coming for children for adolescents. It's not here yet. They're not quite trained completely on it. I don't know the cost, but that is a more of a boot camp type thing for kids and their families. Uh, KM Telecom, we're looking to see if it's possible to offer some type of access to the community channel as far as that documentary I had mentioned before or other types of things that could be available on a loop or some kind of a schedule that, hey, you know, three times a week or five times a week, these things are available, how to deal with your, how to talk to your kids about whatever, or how to deal with whatever it might be. So we're looking there, licensing it as an issue because there's really an unlimited audience. So they aren't sure really if we could, but Mary's gonna look into that for us. Chamber is willing to help. I've got a bunch of volunteers in the chamber that are willing to help get the word out. Uh, community PSAs. Um, I talked with Joe this morning. Um, you know, a lot of the perception is with people in the community, some people is, or just in the world, is that, you know, you don't ask for help because it's a sign of weakness. You know, nobody, nobody does that. So um, he's going to talk with some of our firefighters who sound like they're pretty willing to do it. We're going to put together some videos, uh, some PSA videos type thing to where we can make those available to the kids in school or anybody that, hey, everybody asks for help. And everybody needs the help. So um, appreciate you guys looking at that, and uh, especially I think our firefighters, a lot of our kids can relate to that right now, geared more toward the adolescents. That hey, you know, the, here are these these firefighters that are coming, you know, big bad guys in all their big uniforms, big fire truck. If they can come ask for help after an incident or whatever it is, maybe I can do that too. And then River Ridge, um, that's a new one actually. Um, Melissa from Mayo Clinic uh, forwarded that to me this morning. They are offering free webinars every week, coping with COVID online support group um, at that website. It's something we can get out in our toolkit. It's every Tuesday for an hour and a half, and it's completely free. Um, and I've got about 80 people that I've emailed out, different circles of people in the community just saying, hey, if something like this came available, what do you think the community could do to help each other? And I've got pages of ideas that don't cost anything that people in the community said, maybe if we did this, it would help. So. What I'm asking the council tonight is if we are, would seriously take a look at allocating a chunk of money to mental health for the COVID related. Actually, after you brought that up, I had actually talked to Tim a little about this whole idea and I had asked him if we could use this money for that. So I'm 100% in favor of using this money to see if we can help with this. And it's going to be ongoing. It isn't just now. It'll be ongoing in my opinion so. yeah I agree I think this is a worthwhile initiative um, I think uh, if we can create some PSAs I, I know our park uh, board as and park system has put these uh, movie nights together uh, throwing up a, a three-minute PSA ahead of the movie where families are being there, you know, would help, you know, as mm -hmm. an idea to help drive some of this. So I'm all for it. You can even do it when the movie theaters are going again, there's the yeah. space on there. Yep. Yeah. You know they will. Somebody has to get it started. 
you guys rolling? Well, I mean, I, I heard a lot of the feedback from council already, and I, I think it's a very justified use of funding. And, and uh, you know, to me, I think the biggest issue you talked about just is the fact that sometimes people are afraid to talk about it. You know, and, and uh, we talk about firefighters uh, doing PSA, but I think every adult has gone through times in their life, you know, they may seem like they're very successful. You know, here's the mayor, you know, who's this, you know, successful person. You know, he's gone through things. I've gone through things. You know, I was in the military. You know, everyone feels bad sometimes, but nobody wants to talk about it. And so I just see so much pressure, especially on young people. It's just pressure from every side. And obviously, Catherine has some some things that we want to try and help with. And I think I think this is a perfect opportunity to do that sort of thing. And maybe, you know, like I said, even have some of the council members that be willing to participate in that, you know, and be part of that and say, hey, you know what? I was 15 once too, and there's some things I wish I would have done differently, but, you know, life goes on. And that's a message to some of these young people that just think like the world's ending, even though they're only 15 or 10 years old or whatever, right? It's, it's, a, it's a hard thing, but I think this is a great opportunity. On the heels, I mean, we had a very positive event here tonight with the pool, but it wasn't not too long ago we had a tragic event with the pool right. um, staff too. So I, I think the timing is right, and I, and I said it's a worthwhile initiative. Okay. I mean, in terms of using the funds, the, my thought process is um, make sure that we get the most bang for our buck is to prepay for some of these items. For example, like right. I see 11200 would be your 70 hours at $150 an hour. If we're buying those services now and we're saying, here's our contract with you, then that's, that's spent. So we don't have to worry about that money going back. We don't have to worry about not using it. I mean, it's spent, it's whether we spend it in three months or we or spend it over a year and a half, you know, we could probably look at doing a contract where we say, hey, we want to try and provide, you know, have these services for 75 hours and we're paying for it now. and you know, I, I don't think that an auditor, and I don't see foresee any issues with that because we do that all the time with, you know, things, we pre for things. Okay. So. so I can, on um, that stuff there, so with the council's blessing, I mean, would we need a motion to do Well, that? so what I'm thinking, what I will do. Bring it back to the next. Yeah, meeting. what I will do is actually we'll have a resolution at our next council meeting, and it's going to detail a number of the areas that we will have chosen to allocate funds at. And one of them will be mental health programs. You know, and some of them, I know that uh, the police chief's here tonight, and he's got some, you know, some information in the packet that the police department is looking at requesting some funds. I know that uh, Linda and myself and some other staff here have been looking at facility upgrades that were discussed at council too, especially that, that back area that we're looking to improve. So we're going to have some areas where, in that resolution, the council will be able to just kind of do a blanket one, and then we'll still have that all in that resolution, okay. if that makes sense. Yep. Because that's part of the whole process of this CARES Act, is we have to have the council saying, we believe this is justifiable expense. And then after the council does that, then, you know, it is. Yep. So, okay. so I can have these folks that have the stuff that has a cost to it get us back some type of... Uh, agreement, arrangement, contract, contract something of that nature, so we just document it really well for our auditors and things like that. Like the RFP, right? Something along those lines, yeah. Okay. I will do that then before the next meeting you have it in the packet. That'd be great. Okay. Anything else on that? Or if anybody has any ideas, let me know. Thank you. Public forum, I don't have any cards tonight. Uh, committee reports, EDA July minutes. Those are in your packet. Just wanted to highlight one thing out of the EDA meeting, and, and maybe Dan, you were going to talk about, of course, Chris, you were there. Um, the county, this is going back to the CARES Act funding allocation. The county is going to be allocating um, a substantial amount of money towards economic development. They received, I think, $1.7 and a big chunk of that is going to be going to EDA. Um, we would, uh, they had requested that we participate with them, and that they're asking that we, uh, we allocate a certain amount of funding from our allotment, basically putting into that pot, which they've asked every city in Dodge County to do the same thing. Um, at the EDA, you know, the EDA talked about it, and I think the, the idea, they felt that it was prudent and seemed very sensible, because that allows businesses in our community to access that whole pot. Uh, which is going to be close to a million dollars, as opposed to just the smaller amount that the EDA has available. Um, so one item, you know, we're looking at around $40,000 the city would be pledging to contribute to that in order to participate at that higher level. So um, just wanted you to be aware that right now I think we're expecting to go forward with that um, so that we can hopefully, you know, be able to provide larger amounts to our own local businesses. Perfect. Thank you. Old business, electrical issues, the Eric, switch. 
Yeah. General Link. <laughs> sure. General Link. <laughs> uh, so um, all the members of the, the, the uh, council have received information. It was uh, emailed out to you a couple of times. Um, uh, Mr. Barkstrom brought us uh, an item a couple of uh, meetings ago, and we wanted to be able to, uh, you know, give that some sort of resolution. Um, so I think, you know, we wanted to have that conversation if, if, if council needs to. Um, you have uh, our elected supervisor's responses. Uh, you receive those, and um, his recommendation was to maintain the status quo at this time, uh, based on the conversations that he's had with other utilities in our area. That um, in reality there aren't any other utilities in our area now, which my understanding was that some of the co-ops were allowing it, but he's found that's not the case. And so certainly, while I think that the product um, it might be feasible to utilize, you know, it seems like it's feasible to utilize. I I think that his recommendation to maintain the status quo is probably a sensible action. However, obviously the council makes those rules, and we're certainly open to discussion with any of that. I was just going to say, uh, yeah, I think it is feasible, um, obviously, but the fact that none of our local communities are having, nor no local co-ops are having it. Um, in addition, we do have uh, an accessible and uh, approved switch right. option that we wouldn't need to to go honor this type of thing. So. <laughs> At this point, I would say no, but I would be open to consideration, you know, sometime down the road if the market and mm -hmm. the processes, you know, local area changes. Does the switch we have available now allow for the, the easy hookup, like the one that, I don't know, whatever, Jenner? I think the switch now, correct me if I'm wrong, is at the uh, homeowner's box. Mm -hmm. And not at the meter. So it's inside. Okay. It's, it's inside. Okay. That was my okay. Right. So they would just switch right over to their generator. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just um, go ahead. Uh, part of my problem was, was it was if there was an issue, an alignment comes, up, the city comes out and disconnects the meter. You still have this unit connected. <coughs> and if there's any issue of that, nobody can remove it, but the homeowner and electrician. Well, in my experience, most homeowners aren't going to touch that because they're not feel comfortable enough so if you had an issue with that do we have potential danger you know we need to make sure it's more safe and we need to understand it more there, there's a reason the co-ops aren't allowing it right. and if they have that much respect for it we can't allow it it's a safety issue yes because nobody can remove it but in well, there's always that chance that it's still it could be live. Yep. Always that chance. That's why they don't allow it. No, even if there was no generator hooked up to it. Right. Right. It could still be live. And, and if most times if there's an emergency like that, if the generator is hooked up, you don't think to disconnect that anyways. You're you're like, oh, and you're, you just start pulling stuff. If everybody else uses a meter disconnect. It, that's the way it's done. That's the way we install it. I, I'm not saying it's not never going to happen. I just think right. we need more information. We need more. Mm -hmm. Unless it starts being approved by the bigger co-ops, yeah. you know, that handle and that study thousands of people. Well, co-ops or any other utility. Right. We weren't able to find any other utility in the area to sell or, you know, and, and as I said, I'm not saying there would be a, always be a no. I think it might be feasible in the future. It just seems like right now, um, it, it, would be unsen it, would be, it would make sense for us to be different from everyone else in the field. Right. Okay. We don't need action on that. You don't have to take any action. I just, I mean, the, 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 that was the direction that staff were looking at, and if the council's comfortable with that, then I think right now we're going to maintain that status quo. Okay. Why do we bylaws back for approval? Did you guys? So just to highlight, we did review these, um, and I think that the, uh, the fire relief did take another look at it at their last meeting, and I believe they approved those. Yep. And so I think what we're ready for is the finalization tonight and approval. There were no changes. From nope. the second, the first okay. All right, I'll make the motion to approve. I'll second. Thanks, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? 
on the new business number one, establish change council meeting dates and budget. Sure, Nancy, we'll have Nancy run the sure, and you have a minute there. Yeah. <laughs> Although the first one will be for Tim, but um, yep, so thank you. Welcome everyone. Nice to see everyone tonight. Um, uh, we would normally meet in November on the 11th and then on the 25th as council. The 11th is um, Veterans Day and City Hall is closed that day. And then Tim had pointed out that November 25th is the night before Thanksgiving. And so we're bringing forward for your attention, your consideration of a change in dates for November, however you might wish. I know Tim had a thought about how he might address it, so I don't know if you want to share that. Or if you sure, understand. I guess what I was looking at is potentially we would just have one meeting that month, it would be on the 18th. And then if it was necessary for us to have any other business, we, we could schedule a special meeting, but one regular meeting in, in November. Um, we expect, um, based on the budget that's in place tonight, um, we don't expect that to shift as much as maybe it has in the past years because we feel like we're at a, I feel like we're at a little bit better starting spot than sometimes we've been at. Um, but we do have plenty of meetings ahead of time that will allow for that if we do need to in, in, you know, impact. The other thing that we can do is, uh, if, if necessary, we could have <coughs> a, a special meeting on another day, another night of the week or something like that. Okay. I'm, my schedule, just check my schedule, I'm good for that night. That's Well, they're all checking your schedule. I mean, with this as well as this with the date <coughs> for budget and levy discussions, we'll have opportunities to put the notices in um, the newsletter so that people know of the changes. But you as council need to approve any change dates. That night works for me. I'm good. So, do we need a motion for that? Yes. I'll, I'll make a motion that we cancel the two November meetings, 11th and 25th, and change them to November 18th. Perfect. Do we have a second? I'll second it. Thanks, Lonnie. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Great. Thank you. And then um, this time of year, we, we need to set um, particularly the date for the budget levy discussions in December because the county mails us at a request <coughs> form and we have to fill it out. So that's why we always ask you in the August particularly for that, but there are other considerations this year as well for the rest of the budget and levy process. Um, first of all, you received tonight the draft of the budget and there is a work session planned at your next council meeting at 5 o'clock to discuss some of that. Again, to give the city guidance as to where to go with um, the, the levy or the individual budgets as you see fit. Then for consideration, we usually have uh, the Budget, the preliminary budget and levy approved at the first meeting in September, but um, Tim will be gone that first week and he would like to be present for that. So we're looking at maybe September 23rd for the preliminary budget and levy discussion as well as approval of the resolution for um, those same items. And then uh, looking at December 9th, we usually pick the first meeting in December for the levy and the budget discussion, but then uh, county needs to know what our backup date is, and we've usually gone the very next week, which would require also then um, a motion to, well, not only set those dates, but to change the date of that fourth, or you know, the, the fourth second Wednesday, meeting. your second meeting in December, mm -hmm except that we need to point out there are five Wednesdays in December. So it's kind of open for however you might like to do that other than uh, maybe leaving December 9th for that first levy and budget discussion. You know, if council needs more time, we've got other opportunities throughout the month to call meetings, but we like to kind of always target that and, and, and hopefully resolve those issues earlier in the month rather than later. I'm good with moving. Sixteen. So it'll be twenty third in December, uh, which would give us a plenty of time to get to the county, and then yep. for December we would have our, I mean our primary meeting would be on the ninth, and if there was additional conversation needed, we would have it on the sixteenth. Okay. 
true. So and then if there are other city business, you, right. you call another meeting through the remainder of the month. But right. So we need to uh, entertain the motion to move the December meeting from the 23rd to the 16th. I'll make that motion. I smell. So second. I'll second that. Stand. All in favor say aye. 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 Okay, and then um, can I get a motion on the other date to just to uh, make it official for uh, oh, September 23rd, preliminary, and December 9th, mm -hmm. final? Okay, I'll make that motion. Thank you. So I'll second. second. Thanks, All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Great, right, thank you very much. Thanks, Nancy. And then there is a, a preliminary budget in your, in your files or Dropbox. So it's ahead of our next meeting, you know, if you have a chance to take a look. Uh, please do let me know if you have any questions ahead of time. We can make changes still, um, but uh, we'll plan on having a good uh, discussion about that. Perfect. Thank you. Annexation H2. Sure. Um, this is a topic that uh, is going to be coming up um, more probably than we've had in the last couple of years. Um, this year we have a number of parcels that we expect to be annexed into the, the city and uh, of course be working with our city attorney and our city <coughs> engineer to make sure that we're um, taking a look at the proper look at those. Um, this one in particular is not a very large uh, parcel. It's uh, sort of on the north side of uh, the city. Um, and the, uh, the Planning Commission did review this item at the last, at their meeting on Monday. We discussed it partly because we know uh, as a Planning Commission we've seen some transportation access issues and I don't want us to create more issues. Um, this parcel is right off the uh, sort of off the northwest end of Gasson Meadows uh, sub subdivision, actually not too far from uh, from some of our, our uh, city council members' homes, uh, so they might be you know familiar with this area. Um, the uh, property owner is looking at bringing in basically what amounts to half of their parcel. Uh, well, I'll even just stand and point it out to you. So really we're looking at this parcel right here, uh, kind of on the, the, like the northwest side of the city, and they're looking at basically only bringing in maybe the, the southern third of the, the parcel. And when I sh sat down and talked to uh, the engineer for this project, I did indicate that I felt that bringing the entire parcel in was a better choice. Um, however, the developer would only like to bring this parcel in. They've, they've reiterated their desire for that. Um, I did also have a conversation with uh, Carol over at the township, um, to talk to her about what the process would be for this. And um, so we will definitely look at getting that started in September. You know, this is a small piece of property, so the cash aspect of it is, is not uh, not a large issue. Um, right now, I think they're looking at three homes on this property. They, they would, uh, those apparently those lots have already, you know, looks like they already may have a deal sold, sold wise. Um, the biggest issue is that, I, I, you know, as I said, I think bringing the entire parcel would make more sense, but we know that to the west of this parcel, the, uh, the school district and also the Zumbro Education District are looking at bringing in parcels as well. And I'm working with them right now to uh, try and make sure that that process goes smoothly also. Um, it, it, the nice thing about it is that, uh, you know, if, if we can get these, these folks to do this by petition, it's a little easier for us because, uh, you know, they're the owners of the property. It just makes it smoother with the state and with, with the township. So um, just wanted to bring that to you. And uh, I did include in your packet there the procedure of petition by uh, 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 annexation by petition and kind of how it will, will work is that uh, you know we receive this we share it with the uh, the county board uh, the town board and the administrative law judge and then uh, in this case you know I don't have any objections to bring it in and I don't think the council probably will either it makes sense um, it's a, a budding property um, we in essence would end up paying off the, the township for this parcel you know if we take the tax value over a certain period of time uh, what's worth to them and then we would we would basically just change the borders of the city and bring it in um, one nice thing about it is that'll allow us to continue working on bringing our electrical service territory up to date and trying to, to get that because you know we'll have to acquire this piece of uh, property from them as well so. any questions on that so that's all about bringing in like two lots three basically three, three lots, lots. yeah lots. so i mean you're, you're looking at extended what's that Will the road be extended? The road's going to take just like it is. Um, Brandon, I don't know if I can recall exactly. I think there will be some amendments needed there for sewer access and for that sort of thing. There's a fire hydrant in the middle of the road there. Right. Yeah, correct. So <laughs> this is part of a previously approved GDP. Uh, so we met with the developer. Um, they are looking at extending uh, the sewer from that intersection immediately to the, let's see here, the uh, 21st Street and 20th Street. Um, 
northeast to extending that sewer from that intersection um, to the northwest to serve those three lots. Um, and then likely that hydrant at, that's in the, at the end of the street would be relocated, we said, anyway. Like, like right in the street. Yep, yeah. that's pretty typical uh, when we end the roads uh, that are for future construction. So we can take the kids' basketball hoops and put some stands in out there too. They won't go through that anymore. Well, maybe they'll go to the end of the new <laughs> street. So. Oh, that's awesome. Well, I'm not looking for any action. I, I do want your feedback. As I said, I mean, the city doesn't have to allow them to just bring in this third. Um, you know, it doesn't make a ton of sense to me to bring, bring it in the way we are, but I know that there were some planning commission members who said that they felt like, yeah, they probably should bring it in, but they didn't want to stop this from moving forward. Uh, and I, I certainly understand that. I do think that we know that we have to get be able to get out of Castle Meadows somehow other than the main road that works right now, because that road, you know, very likely this fall we're going to be taking a look at possibly reconstructing that road. It's in, it's in rough shape, it's not it's not been built properly. And so um, we need to have a plan for, you know, probably a west exit and also a north exit. And how is that gonna work? Um, because otherwise we have a huge chunk of town that's running on one very substandard road. And I mean, that's a big concern to me. I imagine the fire department would have some serious concerns about that too. So just speaking of that, the, so the general development plan for that whole area, doesn't that call for the, con the developer there to rebuild that road to a certain standard or is that Question. I'm not sure on that. That's not my understanding. Okay. That, that could be a future conversation between the developer and the city on what sort of financial um, liability or cost share potentially could be for that road. That wasn't a permanent road. Was it? That's a sure. temporary. That's my understanding of the temporary right. road. Um, and then there's some other, Tim, I think you misspoke a little. You talk about access to the west. We were in conversations with that in the school on their future plans to the west for a future access because that's what's shown in the GDP. We may be looking at going east uh, into the little subdivision there. Um, I think I've talked to the developer of potentially connecting that in. It's probably not a lot of use, but it'd be good for the emergency vehicles to have that secondary access. And then, like Tim mentioned, the I'm not sure that's useful, cool, but I know we have some different opinions on whether it should go east or west. So. <laughs> Was, wasn't that the or east? Wasn't that the uh, original plan to go I, east? I believe there was a plan at one point along the east property line of Castle Meadows between Littles and Castle yep. Meadows to have what I was going to call the Master Creek Parkway. Yeah. Uh, a portion of that right away has been vacated, um, deeded back to vacated and given back to the property owners. Right. Um, such that's likely not going to happen. Uh, in addition, we have that trail system through there. Um, so the discussion is, is if we b rebuild the road entering Castle Meadows, where's the second access if, if Master Creek Parkway is not built? to the east to Littles, to the north end of the township. There's a parcel land there, uh, partially owned by this developer, my understanding is, um, that may end up coming into the city. Um, that's not currently built on, or to the west, or to the school, um, to ride a secondary access over there. We're in this conversation with the school about if they desire that access or not. So things we're working on, we don't need to necessarily address with this annexation and this development. It would be a future development. And I, I know a lot of the neighbor put people up there very well. and. Um, I think if, yeah, bringing in the whole thing would make more sense, but I think if you brought the whole thing in, then the concern would be you're going to add 30 homes with only one way in, one way out. You might get a lot of public pushback for the sure. three more lots. Sure. Okay, so that's, that's, not a, that's not an issue that's going to bring up. Yeah, I'm not yeah. very cognizant of that. I just, you know, I want to make sure we're doing our best practices, and that's why I bring the point up. Yeah, no, it makes sense. Make sure sure and the conditions, the conditions we have now with building and right. development and uncertainty and all that, smaller projects make sense. Yeah, and we're lacking a, a good transportation plan for this area here, so we need to really identify what the needs are, irregardless of what the property owner's desires are. We have to identify what the city needs are. And, and, and I think the west exit, uh, north exit, and even the east exit uh, into Littles, uh, I know that was a concern because of the elevation at 22nd there. Uh, it's a significant drop off, probably about 10 feet or more um, within a short distance there. So I don't know how that could be accommodated, but maybe a, a little bit further north as a possibility. We don't, I don't know. But um, certainly we need at least two more exits out of there in addition to what 10th Avenue. Thank you very much. Yep. Thank you. Uh, Police Department Cares Act requests. 
Sure, and uh, we've got our chief here, and I'm sure he can give us a little bit of a report too while he's here. I really appreciate that, your attendance, and, and giving us that feedback. Um, the EMS committee did, uh, did meet and review some of these items, and um, these are items that we felt uh, potentially would qualify for some CARES Act funding. Um, and they're, they're items that uh, would allow for primarily the, the justification would be remote access of the facility and some technology upgrades that we know may be necessary. Um, so go ahead, Josh, if you want to. Well, I think Tim described everything. There, there are technology upgrades that I'd be looking at in the next five years anyways, and they would just move us forward and allow that remote access. And um, if our officers didn't need to come back to the office, this would allow them just to pull up and uh, mainly dump uh, data off their camera systems in their cars. That's the primary upgrade. Uh, the phone upgrade, uh, we did run into a problem, a problem when we were working remotely with our main line, uh, accessing it from different locations. We're gonna move forward with that anyways. So uh, actually, it just got installed today and we can now access our main line off of cell phones. Is there any possibility of body cameras with the camera uh, with, with this watch guard upgrade, it will allow, in the future, if we want to add body cameras, you just pay a licensing fee, okay. and it will automatically, it will use the same system to upload the videos. We, uh, uh, first I did that. take a look at it. What we wanted to do is justify everything we could up to that point. Justifying body cameras with COVID money is, is uh, something I think we would have a hard time doing, simply because it's not directly correlated with the COVID. Sure. But we well, need however, if we can make it basically body camera ready, at a, p a point in the future where you know we were, I was hoping that maybe they'd include some funding with the police bill they passed this year. At a point in the future, body cameras are just going to be standard, and I think that the state may allow for us to do that, or we may choose to just start purchasing one a year or something like that to keep within our budget needs. This will allow us to be at that point where it should be pretty seamless. Actually, if we had this, uh, the body cameras themselves are cheap. This is what ends up being the expensive part okay. beyond. So you need to have this to have You need cameras. to have this, and then there'd be a licensing fee for body cameras and the data storage. Yep. All right. So is there any questions? Any questions from the chief? Otherwise, I'll have this item included on that resolution along with some of the other requests. And then I know, um, did you have any other updates as long as you're here? Just I know some people have talked about this, uh, this car car thief ring whatnot. Uh, yeah, <laughs> some, someone might have been a victim here, we don't know, but that was yeah. out in the county. <laughs> um, th we've had several vehicle break-ins and vehicle thefts in Cass and Byron uh -huh. area. Um, we've arrested people on it and some have been released. Others have warrants out for their arrest, so lock up your vehicles and let your neighbors know uh, not to leave valuables. Um, all of them are basically unlocked vehicles with keys in them or valuables in them. So. Just remind your neighbors to lock up. Wow, thank you. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, administrator's report. Sure, you've got my report there and uh, a couple of items, obviously we're all wearing masks tonight, which is in a way it actually is a positive because I think it makes it a little easier. You know, maybe not wearing is that much fun, but now we're all wearing them and so we're, we're locked in. And staff has been really good I know uh, we've done some changes here at City Hall, but I think overall the, the, the fellows over at uh, Public Works and our other staff are really doing a good job of trying to, to keep up with that. Uh, a couple other things included in there. I'm not gonna belabor any of those. Um, Nancy and I are both watching the LGA to see what happens there. We're taking a very conservative approach on that because we do expect cuts. So you'll see that in, in your budget um, reports. We're, we're looking at a 20% redu <coughs> revenue reduction on LGA. Um, up, you know, that's, um, I'm hoping that it doesn't exceed that because if it does, then we have some even larger issues to deal with. But um, we are expecting a budget forecast also from the state here, hopefully. Um, other than that, the natural gas franchise fee, uh, I believe that's in your, will be coming up to that here. Um, we can talk about that. I did email out some of that information and some other information is included in your packet. Uh, but before we get to that, I wanted to just ask uh, for some feedback on one more item. And I appreciate uh, Nancy reminding me about this. Uh, we had a, uh, I don't know, a request yeah. to uh, uh, from someone who has their uh, grandmother interred at the cemetery, and uh, that person felt that they were maybe Nancy, you should talk about it. Actually. Sure, that sure. seems like a good idea. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, yeah, get get right. through it brief. Um, a woman called who um, has relatives buried in the cemetery, but she also has 
a paranormal investigative team. And she's been out there before and oh. had success, oh. but now she wants to do it at night. And she, you know, she was very kind to have called because it's technically closed at night, which is why we'd like counsel to either be aware of it or to approve mm. if, if we're going to allow her access to the cemetery at night. Now, it's not walled in. We don't, you know, I don't know if there's any kind of a other activity out there, but um, she mm. did, she was essentially asking for permission, and if you allow it, then we'd need to let um, the police department know so there aren't any issues. Um, that night. She anticipates she'd be out there before death, dusk because the team would need to set up and she anticipates she'd be done by about 2 in the morning but it could be earlier. Who knows? She'd be willing to have a meet and greet with anyone who would like to meet out there beforehand at dusk. It's, uh, it's August 22nd is what she's requesting and just like we do with road closures for the parade or all these other exceptional things uh, we thought we should bring it to councils so that you're aware of it, and uh, and if you you know didn't want to allow it, then we can get back to her and let her know. We are having her sign release forms. She's obviously aware of layouts of cemeteries and what can happen, but we're asking her entire team to sign a liability waiver um, because it's dark and they're not going to be you know going to turn on a lot of lights or anything like that. So uh, we were just asking. Uh, for your approval or uh, not allowing it out there while the cemetery is closed. What's the name of the paranormal group? Uh, the paranormal, it's, it's well, a lovely, lovely bones paranormal. Yep. I, I, I brought up the wrong sheet. That's all right. So you gave it to me. So. I'll make a motion to approve. Oh. You second? I'll second that. I'll oh, favor said I. Uh, but before we get that, uh, <laughs> as far as the liability, I want to make sure that we if there's any damage mm -hmm. that they incur any costs. Okay. Uh, because uh, if they were to tip over a tombstone sure. or something like that, that yeah. I mean, I want to make it sure. It can go both ways, sure. Yeah. sure. Do we want to require a deposit then, are you thinking, or what are you thinking there? I just wanted in writing that in they writing cover uh, any expense that if there is a damage. Okay. I mean, I've but done a whole bunch of these paranormal things in Manorville with theater and, and chapter groups out there, and they're typically pretty respectful. This is a group I'm not familiar with, uh, so I, I can't say one way or the other. Sure. Okay. Well, I can, I can share your name after work. Um, I forget what city she's out of. I mean, it's, it's fairly okay. close to here, okay. but again, her grandparents yep. are there, so um, she has a connection to the community. The only thing I'd be concerned about, <coughs> there's some families that have family members interred out there that wouldn't appreciate it. Meaning, I mean, not, uh, we can ask them to be respectful about where they walk. Okay. And I'm that would be I'm daytime or nighttime. I, I definitely understand that. So but by the same token, they could go during the day and do it. As yeah. well, and yeah. we couldn't then buy them access because it's open to the public during the day. I get it, but when you're approving something as a mm -hmm. whole, mm -hmm. it's different than somebody just walking out there no, and good. doing it. Okay, I'll do it. It's not real anyway. <sighs> Are you sure? I'll make the motion. Yeah, I'll leave the second. Yeah. I, it was it. Was it me? Sure. Yeah. Okay. No. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed. All right. Thank you. She will appreciate it. She sounds very nice. <laughs> you can all go out there if you like. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And stay yeah. through. It's not yeah. just a meet and greet. It's, it's been a while since I've done one of these, but that 2 a.m. wrap up is really Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Nancy. Anything else, Tim? Uh, well, of course, I mean, just going down on the items here that we have in the packet, there's a memo there talking about natural gas franchise fee. Um, and it just details some. Uh, uh, communities, uh, you know, uh, that were very specific to our area too. Um, you know, I am seeking action on this uh, sooner than later, um, partly because we'd like to start uh, that process of um, looking at how we would fund a, um, you know, a facility upgrade project. Um, right now, I just came up with some numbers, basically looking that um, we have about. Uh, you know, between 230 and 240 thousand dollars of cost on a five million dollar building if we were using USD 
EPA funding for a four-year project based on interest rates um, that I've seen, you know, uh, for them. Up to, I think right now, my back of the envelope number, because that email I did send out, he had a, he had a number that included some addresses that are outside of the city. Um, but um, we know that we'd be able to generate close to half of that with the natural gas franchise fee. And if we started collecting it ahead of the project date, that would allow us to build a fund balance up, which would, would even mean that in the first couple of years, we wouldn't have to levy quite as much to subsidize that. So, um, you know, you can see what they're doing as the, the council had asked. There, there are options there for base fee and then per therm. I think that was the feedback I had, and it's very common. A good example would be, uh, you know, what Stewartville has, which is a, a city in our area. And they've got that uh, base fee, and then they have the volumetric fees per therm for both residential, uh, commercial, and uh, industrial customers. And then that's kind of how it would be listed on someone's bill. So, um, you know, if I'm on the wrong track, let me know and we can revise that. Otherwise, I, I think uh, it would make sense for us to, uh, you know, move forward on some sort of, pro you know, program. Good. If we look into go forward, is there a way staff could just bring one number to us instead of, of what you think you want per fee? Well, my, my suggestion, my suggestion would be to pick one of these, uh, you know, numbers. You know, for example, as I said, I said Stewartville because it's uh, the city that's the closest in our area. You know, we could pick that number and that could be what we could go with. I don't want to. I'm not trying to dictate to you. You, you know, you pick what you want, but. Um, you know, this would be new to us, and we don't know exactly how much revenue it's going to generate until we've actually had a year. Um, we can estimate it, but um, you know, you know, it certainly is up to the to the council however you'd like to to move forward. Let's use Stewartville. Yeah. That's the closest one to our size. It's near us. <laughs> and they do all the... Yeah, I think it's pretty straightforward. Um, you know, realistically, the way it would be collected is that uh, it would be like a lot of our other franchise fees, so it would be collectible per quarter. You know, they would make a payment after a certain period of time. You know, 30 days after the quarter, it would have to be uh, paid to the city. And then I think the idea and the concept would be that we would separate that revenue out in its own, you know, natural gas utilities fund, just like we would with Storm or any of the other utilities that we've created, so that we're not using that to subsidize our general operation. You know, it's intended to reduce the taxpayer's burden on debt service for projects that are coming, that we know are coming forward. I, will, I would think that they should be able to provide us with an average household. Sure, and I can, get a, I can get an estimated number from them, I would think, yeah. I mean, if, if you look at the top of that memo, it does give you a guideline and says basically, um, Minnesota's, uh, Minnesota Energy Resources has uh, 2606 customers with CAS and addresses. Um, he notes in there that um, this is some of this information is taken from the consumer uh, rep. He notes that some of those are outside of the, the city limits. Uh, however, you know, that it's reasonably close. You can see that there's some on residential, some on commercial, uh, and then some are uh, the different types of commercial classes. So. You know, if we're looking at around 2,500 uh, connections, you know, base fees, um, you know, we could give that number. Um, the therm number, I don't know how that works exactly, but I can certainly see if they can give us an estimate. Well, I did about. email Stewartville and I asked the, the finance director down there to see what they are generating because I did feel like that would be, you know, obviously it's not exactly the same size, yeah. but um, I know Fairmont, uh, which is a little bit larger community with a little larger tax base, just um, reauthorized theirs and they're looking at around 265,000. So I'm looking at a kind of a smaller industrial commercial tax base here. You know, I would ballpark it around half that. So, you know, as I said, between 125 and $150,000 a year probably. Yeah. I, I know on my gas bill, when we get it in the wintertime, they, they give me a graphic of your usage as it compared to <coughs> the average household in the community. Sure. So they've got that little state. The thermos numbers. Yep. Yeah. So it's they could provide that sure. so we could just fall, fall apart what yeah. this would impact. Okay. Do we need motion on that? Or you well, right, um, bring it back. Bring some yeah, so, so what I can do is I'll get those numbers for you and I can get, um, we can even prepare to have that hearing potentially to authorize this and 
Uh, at that point, you'll have those firm numbers, hopefully, and if, if it's agreeable to you, then we'll, we'll authorize that. And um, we can, I think it's 90 days, so we, we might end up not starting until uh, later in you know, January or something like that. But they have a certain period of time that they have to build a ramp up for it. Okay. Thank okay. you. Okay. Diane. Sure. Um, this is something that uh, was brought to my attention by, uh, by our park supervisor. Um, there's a property there you can see, Mr. Uh, Mr. Hansen. Uh, he has property to the west that's currently in the park, uh, part of the park system, but he's interested in acquiring it. And I'm so thankful to Nancy. She was able to go back in the records and take a look at some previously similar uh, projects. This was back in 2011. We had uh, uh, a resident, uh, Tim Mendenhall, who wanted to acquire property from the city. It was adjoining onto this property. It was part of a park that was never completed. Um, at that time, the, the city did authorize it. Basically, what I wanted to get from you is, um, are you interested in allowing this property to be acquired and the process you would like us to follow and then um, you know what would be our pricing apparatus I guess so if you see the neighbor to the north there Mr. Uh, Robert Skaug or, or something like that at one point in the past he had acquired that lot directly west of him and at this time that's kind of what the, the resident to the south there is looking at he would be uh, you know, acquiring not all the way up to the creek, but a, a similar sized lot, that square lot off, um, because he'd like to uh, do landscaping in the back and he'd like to be able to store more items and things like that. Obviously, there's no reason that we have to take any action at all. However, at the same time, this is a piece of land that's not used by the city generally, and it is uh, something we're mowing. So, you know, and, and that's kind of my perspective, is if there's parts of the, you know, it's not a part of the park that's actively being utilized, being on the east side of the creek, um, you know, the city doesn't need to have more land ownership necessarily. So I take it this is down here? Yep, that would be down over in kind of southwest. It lives uh, 721 Main Street North. Yeah. Did I put the wrong way? Well, that was probably wrong, but it's definitely not. That's where I was. Sure, sorry if I had something wrong typed in when I took the screenshot, maybe, but. <laughs> you know, blocking a. Uh, about a block south and a little bit west, or west and a little bit south of the former shop close site. Okay. Up to the creek. Okay. Oh, wow. Okay. later. Rupert used to live. Yes. Yeah. Two yeah. houses south of where Rupert used to live. I believe. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, I see. Yep. If this land we're mowing, we don't use it for anything at all. We never use that land for anything since I've lived here. This is not the part that's part of the former fish golf. I don't believe so. You know how how big of an area it is. You know, I don't, but I can look that up here. You know, just by um, right. going by what his uh, what what his property looks like. Mm -hmm. As I said, no action is required, and I just wanted to bring it up to you because I don't know what the council's perspective on. Is there you know, a storm or a fire going across no. there? It says riser on there. Seems yeah. like years yeah. ago we run a tile or a storm sewer or something across there. So. I'll get to your point. Uh, Tim, you asked how big it was. It's about 0 0.2 acres if you keep the same lot depth, uh, depth as the property is north. Okay. Roughly. Just maybe Lonnie to your question that uh, that riser there that looks like electrical utility that maybe in the back of those houses that's something we'd have to. We would have to get an easement for that. Sure. Yeah, the already came the property. Then, right. one. then there's a storm outlet farther to the south, Lonnie. Um, Here's that property yep. coming out here to the creek. Right. Yeah. That's what here. Okay, yeah. that's where it was. Okay, okay. Comes here, friends, yep. comes up to the creek. Yep. So straight back. Yeah. I knew we did something yeah. back in there. Maybe I'll just point out one thing. Um, we haven't talked about this at staff level, so I'm maybe a little out of place here if it hasn't been discussed. Um, there is some right away for Fifth Street Southwest uh, between the grant and the. Uh, Marlin property to the south of Hanson there is uh, Grant. So their their theory is kind of, or in, in theory, uh, access to kind of the backyards of those houses there to that parkland through again, it appears the public right away of Fifth Street extended to the west. Uh, so it, it could have a little better access than what may appear in the picture due to that, that public right away there. Just wanted to point that out just so we make a, an educated discussion and decision. So we're looking at the south vacation of that Fifth Street, proposed Fifth Street extension. I don't know if I recommend that. I mean, it'd be 
something this council to consider uh, because if that fifth street right away is retained there's additional property assuming you sell off the, the land immediately behind Mr. Hansen's um, property there's still be a significant amount of land that the city would own there. So is, is, is Mr. Hansen going to buy the whole chunk behind both those lots or just behind My understanding was then the property directly behind his it's it's extended lot. Yeah, yeah, that was kind of oh, so yeah. similar to what his, uh, his neighbor does in North there. Yeah, so okay. Could staff have more chance to look at it and tell us what Yeah, there's no rush on this. I just wanted to get your, you know, just bring it to you and get some feedback because yeah. I don't know how you've done the past. Uh, and Nancy had found that in the file that they have, you have done, you know, the council has done in the past. But it'd be nice to know more information on what's there for easements and sure. that riser and, yeah. uh, and, then, and what we've done in the past and how to make sure. Yeah, I mean, it, it looks look like it, it, this, this one from 2011, basically what they did was they, they authorized the sale, but they required the, uh, the resident who was acquiring it to um, create the, the parcel description and, and survey it. So they basically said, yes, we'll sell it to you, but you have to take the onus and get a survey and then have the surveyor create that you know, parcel description for this land. But the park board hasn't seen this? No, no, I just no, brought it to not. you. And the process I'm looking at would be that we would discuss it today, we'll kick it down to the park board, they can take a look at it, and then make a recommendation as an old business item to you at, at a future meeting. And that's kind of how I'd like to do it. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. And I, I think we also kind of need to be based on what Brandon showed me, the larger view of yes. this area. Absolutely. So we got everything. Yep. I just wanted, to, to, just wanted to bring it to your attention as informational. So. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Thanks, Tim. You bet. Anything else? Oh, let's see. Uh, nope, not for me. Ah. All right. Engineer's report, 16th Street. All right, thank you, Mayor and Council. I understand uh, last meeting you guys had some conversations on a couple items on 16th Street, so I want to follow back up with you all. Um, first, uh, regarding some surface defects that we've experienced on that roadway, uh, we met with the contractor and also MnDOT's pavement engineer regarding some of that. Um, I think the contractor has acknowledged the fact there is some surface defects there. Uh, we, we both don't believe um, that there is any structural uh, integrity issues with the pavement. Uh, the contractor is running some tests on that. Um, so we haven't worked out what the resolution of the contractor is at this point. Um, but just know that we are working on that. We'll be bringing it back to the council for a formal action in the future. So we are on it and uh, working on it. Any questions regarding that item? All right. Second item regarding speed out on 16th Street. Um, we, we ultimately posted that road at 45 mile an hour. Uh, we may be experiencing some heavier <coughs> speeds out in that area. Um, I think that was discussed last meeting. So when, when engineers design roadways, uh, we, we have a couple things in mind. One is what we design the design speed of our roadway for, and then what the statute says for posting speeds and how they may or may not be the same. Uh, so how that relates to this project, uh, when we built 16th Street, we only tried to design it for 55 mile an hour design speed. Uh, we had some limitations, specifically the two hills that were uh, pretty nasty hills that you go up and over. Uh, we call them crest curves, and we have sight distance when you go over the hill something down the downstream side of the hill you want to make sure at nighttime your headlights can see that and you have a, a, a appropriate amount of time to stop. So when we designed that, we ultimately designed it for 45 mile an hour. Why didn't we design it for 55? Uh, there's a couple houses and some driveways to the Holtz property and then the Township Road and the Whitaker property. Uh, we just weren't able to cut those hills down far enough. Uh, we made an engineering judgment to consider that. You know, we buy the house out, do we cut it down, it ends up being in a big low point, now we have snow. Uh, drifting into those locations. So we said 45 mile an hour is probably appropriate. Uh, and then when we designed that, we I made the decision to post it at 45 mile an hour, uh, knowing that it's probably more conservative than what we're going to experience out there, that obviously that's probably what we're experiencing. Um, so now the question is, what do we post it at? Um, so when we made that posting, Paul Burks and I even talked about, we may have some 45 mile an hour uh, signs here by the time where this is all said and done. But I want to be a little more conservative out of the gate. Um, so that leads into the statutory requirement and how does that relate to what we post and do we just want to leave it at the statutory uh, speed limit of 55 mile an hour. Um, so my thought is I think ultimately that's probably where we're going to be at. If we wanted to leave it at 45 and we technically could enforce it, uh, we would have to do an engineering study, look at those vertical curves, look at what the traffic is doing to the traffic study. Um, and I don't think we'd ultimately be at 45 mile an hour. Um, so maybe appropriate at this time to just remove those signs and leave it 55 mile an hour. Um, I have some concerns about the hills, but um, ultimately that design speed can be less. And I wanted to drive it, feel that I've driven it at night. I'm assuming you, as a counselor, have driven it 
55 seems appropriate, uh, hence why in the 85 percentile the traffic's going 55. Um, so that's that's the backstory that I didn't maybe get into the details um, to the design process, but that's what we do as engineers when we look at that. So happy to take any feedback of the council if you'd like us to pursue this leaving at 55 and posting it as such. Um, we don't think we have any issues with that from a liability standpoint, what the state statute says, uh, leaving it at 55. But if technically we wanted to leave it at 45 to truly make it enforceable per the state statute, we'd have to do a design study. Um, actually, I've been not to do that design study. Um, they would be looking at things like that, those vertical curves and the design speed, um, but it likely won't support 45 mile an hour. Um, when everybody says do a design study to lower your speeds, I always tell them that's a slippery slope because we'll likely be increasing the speeds uh, because we will be looking at what the traffic uh, speed um, is, in is that road is experiencing at the time of the traffic study, uh, the speed study. Sure. Um, so that's the, the back story on where we got to the point that we were. Again, I was a little, I want to be a little more conservative on what we posted. Let's get it built. We have, you know, all these engineering tables that we design off of, but I wanted to really feel the road before we we looked at what the speed was, was going to be uh, when we ultimately built it out. So uh, take any feedback you want, and then we can we can circle back with any other formal action needed at a later date. Yeah, it's a good, good yeah, thank you. Thank you. Got some questions. The biggest question I have, if you change it to 55, which everybody's doing anyway, and I've realized that, can you move that speed limit 30 sign farther out? Or, or step because right down. now you come over hill and boom you gotta hit 30 and nobody does yeah if it, I, that the county has actually been out there east to west I yeah. control there's, there's a speed limit is there i believe we have a speed limit ahead sign for 30 miles but uh, not not soon yeah. enough they're still doing 45 but having to hit that no, some I bridge mean, it, it kind of scared me to be honest because all of a sudden i was i was like you oh. come over the hill and boom, boom, speed limit 30, it's 30. Boom, you're 30 yeah. and there's okay. nobody. You can't. It's you an don't issue. realize where you are now that you've got a nice, nice smooth road yeah. coming in from where you are. You still think you're way out from yeah. where the speed limit changes. But uh, at least consider a happy medium in which we consider 50 or 55 beyond the Whitaker property because we know we have a potential development coming in in between those two hills. Mm -hmm. So to reduce it to you know keep it at 45 in between there. But with the advance notice of 30, mm -hmm. you know, so and we've got that transition coming into town. But with that, would we have to do that speed study to have it enforceable 45? Again, can we, we put up a 45 mile hour and just not enforce it? Yes, I think we can. I mean, that's. I, it, that area would raise a question on our, <laughs> our 16th Street being posted at 30 and not experiencing 30 mile an hour traffic on 16th Street. I mean, that, that, that could be the secondary part of this conversation, too. Um, and that would fall back to the state statute. State statute says speeds must be this in certain areas. Local streets are 30. Um, unposted county roads, which is our, what our road is 55, and less speed study, which is also an engineering study to show it, posted different, completed by MnDOT. Or just put the, put the speed, speed decrease sign, like you said, further Probably. out on the other side of that hill so that people start right. slowing down earlier. As soon as you come up, you see it, and by then it's... Yeah. I think that's maybe the most cost-effective, probably the easiest solution, yeah. really. Leave it 55, so that's what the statute says it has to be, and then move the 30, upcoming 30, whatever yeah. I had. I mean, because I'll be honest, I drive that, and I mean, it's a reminder you got to, you know, slow down to where earlier, because usually you get to that hill and you're still maybe going over 30. Oh, yeah. yeah. I'm sure a lot of people are. It's a nice, nice smooth road. Nice smooth road, and you don't realize it, and then you yep. press the hill and it says, boom, speed yeah. limit ahead. And you see the bridge, and you're not like, oh, going 30 wow. until we yeah. get right to the flashing sign. Well, yeah. Yeah. And yeah. even then, they're not. Right. Yeah. right. So, does that work, Brandon? Yeah, no, it definitely will take that, and uh, we'll circle back with the speed limit ahead sign and go from there. Perfect. And then uh, maybe, maybe the other point about a transition 45. Uh, maybe, uh, I don't know who said it, uh, somebody's right there regarding a transition. If we see that development happen, that's something we can look at because there is another statute that has kind of an intermediate speed, which is called more of a rural suburban speed, which is 40, 45, I don't know the exact statute, but we could look back at that statute to see how that would relate to that section of the corridor of 16th Street to see if we could have that intermediate posting. Um, all things we'll consider to chase down with public work, so perfect. Thank you very much, Brandon. I know, I know this isn't the east part of 16th Street, but 16th Street by 5th there, there's no, when they painted the 
crosswalks? They didn't paint any crosswalks there and they're still signs. Is that something? Yeah, so that inter the, we got a lot of things in play at that intersection. Um, if you may remember, that was part of our Safe Routes to School planning grant. It was part of our Safe Routes to School infrastructure grant in 2022. And then we did the demonstration project, which was the uh, delineators, all the little poles out there that I understand was not real well received. Right, yeah. Um, so in the planning for the Safe Routes to School plan, we actually removed those posts uh, through the winter. And now this, uh, this spring, uh, we did not repaint that with the plan that we were still working out what the, the final resolution was going to be to the Safe Routes to School infrastructure project uh, with the idea that Public Works is going to paint those stripes when school before school um, is back in order, um, just the crosswalk striping that is. Okay. Um, and then with the Safe Routes to School program, we're not going to put back in those delineators. We're going to tighten up some of those curve radiuses. We met with the school transportation division, um, had them run a school bus through there. Uh, we ran some different uh, turning movements in the soft design software uh, and then not put the bump outs back in is what um, the conclusion between us uh, staff and the school staff. Um, so that'll be back to the city council at a more formal approval when we develop those plans. Or if you have any comments on that, please speak now so we can be efficient on our design process. But we understood there's some traffic backups that there was some difficulties getting the buses through. That was obviously not the intent. Um, we looked at refining, we make it a little better, and I think by the time we get all said and done, we just said, let's just bump those curves out a little bit on the radiuses on the south side, and then I think we're going to meet some of the needs that we want for pedestrian crossings, and then obviously allowing school buses to get through the intersection. So, any comments or questions on that? Sir? Perfect. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, it's just Thank been you. brought up, and I just want to verify it. Okay, perfect. Thanks, Brad. Yep, Appreciate no problem. All right, uh, personnel, uh, we have a resignation from the police department. Officer McSweeney is resigning and moving on. I'd like to thank him for his service to the city of Cassidy. He was a part-time officer in the city. Anything else you'd add to that, Josh? No. Okay. I'd like to thank Officer McSweeney for his service, and I'll entertain a motion to approve his resignation. I'll so make a motion. Well, thank you. I'll second that. All, right. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Next, we have a resignation from the liquor store from Katie. Katie Eswagen. Uh, she's moved on and would like to wish her the best at her position she has at the Mayo Clinic now. Um, always sad to see you know, good employees go, but you can't uh, fully get somebody to go and do what they want to do. So uh, I'll move to accept with thanks. Yep, thanks, All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. For correspondence, any questions on the correspondence? We caught a lot of stuff in there, so if there are questions, please go ahead. We've got a number of items in there. Uh, certified LGA amounts, that's a pretty soft certification, I'll be honest. I was surprised they certified it because they have a big budget hole they got to reconcile. Um, we've got the Legion event schedule, so if you have time to take part in those Legion events, they're going to have a real fun time. Friday, we're setting up the uh, parade route. We're going to put the barricades and things get that ready to go so if you're if you're interested uh you know that uh, bagpipes burgers and beers sounds like it might be kind of a fun event for you know council members you know especially if you're campaigning you know <laughs> anyway uh we had successful elections too so i wanted to thank uh, linda and the election judges for that uh, otherwise do take a look at that budget if you have time um, just highlighting that uh, nancy put a ton of time into it and she and i sat down with all the department heads we went through this at length um, i think right now the uh, first look is uh, 5.9, which uh, I, I feel like is a good starting point for us to be looking at. Um, yeah, and bring all those questions. We're meeting at 5 o'clock before the next meeting, correct? For work session, is that correct? Yes. Right, Nancy? Yep. Okay. Um, yeah, and thanks to everybody for putting everything in there, all the reports we get from the department heads and that. Uh, the letters, thank you yeah. for yeah. the letters you get there. Nice to yeah. hear that. Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. um, <laughs> anything else? No, we'll see everybody at 5 o'clock in two weeks. Let's get a motion for adjournment. Make that motion. Thanks, Dan. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Are you looking at the sign out there? 16th Street, right off of they have the, uh, I believe it's just 30, and then there's another sign for the 20th, this new zone.